if there's a way of living in an improvisational dance with the weather, but also with a really kind of um, turbulent political condition, is there also a way that the built environment can engage that kind of form of living rather than kind of modern forms of control and, and organization? I'm Craig Rushke. I'm Anne Louie. Our practice is called Future Firm. Originally, the name was kind of a placeholder. When Craig and I were working corporate and pulling 80 to 100 hour weeks, we'd always say to each other, like, at the Future Firm, we won't do it this way. When we started, we didn't really know what we were getting into, so it felt like it wasn't yet a practice. And now we describe future firm as those two words being in conversations. Future is like the way that architecture can kind of catalyze new ways of thinking or be speculative, but then firm is the way that like architecture should also be structurally sound and not leak and, you know, serve the people that it's for. But I think future also still holds for us a kind of like sense of ambition for the practice that that the practice isn't totally known. The kind of places we are now might not necessarily be the places that the practice is going. For me, the relationship between future and time is probably heavily influenced by my training as a landscape architect. Landscape architecture for me taught me to think about the way a design is going to evolve and change over the, the course of its life. We thought about Storm Speed City and Hong Kong before the most recent round of protests and the new security law. So I think in some ways it was about a Hong Kong that maybe we don't, don't see so strongly anymore. For us, the idea was that if I uh, invited you to my birthday party, instead of saying, come to my birthday party on next Saturday, I might say, come to my birthday party three sunny days from now. That we might start organizing our lives around the, the weather and the radar and the, the kind of fluctuations of that weather rather than rigid structure of the, the kind of standard days of the week. And if we do that, how does it change the city, the way that we have to communicate with one another, the architectures that we build or urban environments that we live in? We were inspired by these typhoon signals to warn people about typhoons that were coming because there was no app on your cell phone, right? Um, but that people kind of knew to look for these beacons. And so there was a sense that like Hong Kong was already kind of living in this, this kind of fluctuating way. Now there's like a really responsive app that people use, but like it wasn't, I think, lost on us either that one of the, the protest slogans of the pro-democracy Hong Kong protesters was be like water. How protesters engage the city fluctuating and trying to kind of move around in forms of, of kind of control and violence from the police is not actually so different from geographic location that has had to reckon with what is like one of the largest spreads in climate events that can occur in any given year. So we think there's like some kind of relationship there and, and is the kind of missing link architecture. If there's a way of living in an improvisational dance with the weather, but also with a really kind of um, turbulent political condition, is there also a way that the built environment can, can engage that kind of form of living rather than kind of modern forms of control and, and organization? Is there too much architecture that is creating a fake climactic condition or weather condition around <laughs> us that we're trying to maintain perfect weather all of the time? instead of embracing the changing and sometimes not perfect weather. There are many futures embedded in the kind of present moment. The future of thinking in it, like when we're trying to make an image for this project, like we thought to ourselves, like how do we get people to talk about or think about something that seems like really unglamorous? I think trying to imagine it not just as a kind of band-aid to an urgent need and be kind of from this position of like scarcity or, or, or kind of like ogling at poverty, but instead that it's like an opportunity for architects to think at scale, to work at scale, to serve the public in a different way. Uh, and that might be like kind of fun and messy and produce an environment that's different than, than what people think. There are many people who do things in garages uh, in Chicago that is not park. So they run small businesses, sometimes legally, sometimes illegally. They have housing units, some of them legal, some of them illegal. They organize, they do uh, CSAs, they have parties, they practice their bands. Like it's different in every neighborhood. What seemed important to us is that all this work was already happening, some of it illegally, but the zoning, building, and municipal code could be changed to accommodate that kind of life 
and actually make it more accessible to more people. There's a kind of unequal burden of risk right now for those who want to be garage rebels in the sense that those who can afford to take the risk do and those who can't maybe aren't able to have access to the same fun alley and garage life that they might want to have. So for us, I think in Rebel Garages, the future is, is about making a kind of future in which we could like proliferate the conditions of the present in a way that's more equitable by changing policy, but that the building code actually has itself also possible and multiple futures that should be impacted by the way people live and not just by whoever writes it. I think Rebel Garages imagines to a messier future for Chicago that we find really important. It's like the thing that Chicagoans keep trying to sweep under the rug, like that they want to use the zoning code to get rid of the auto mechanic shop in the alley, change the way that the, the the density works within neighborhoods. And actually, I think there's a lot of people that look at their the kind of garage side of their their lots and think about this as like the maybe the more vibrant and messy side of the city. And so for me, those kind of like little acts of future thinking are actually acts of resistance. And the way that architecture kind of helps them is like we can pull a permit to, to make that come true. Night Gallery, because of the way that it projects out onto the public sidewalk, brings in and gets people to look at it that would never spend the time to go to a gallery to see the same show if we had advertised it. And I think you are able to kind of capture the interest of some people in public space in a dynamic and interesting way. Like we had this one exhibition that had a, a webcam <laughs> that was filming people on the street and then it would basically Photoshop some of the people out and they would appear later. So there were like these ghosts of people walking behind you while you were live on the webcam. This year we brought Night Gallery to the South and West Sides because the questions about public space and who has access to it and who we should share and engage and promote through the work it changed a lot for us this year. And one of the things we did was we just partnered with two other businesses that are businesses during the day, but community spaces by night, one of which is Silver Room, which we renovated, but the other which is Principal Barbers, which is just like a barber shop during the day, but a community space at night. We commissioned works from a West Side artist and a, and a Chicago-based artist. And the people who came were people who had lived in North Lawndale for, for 60 years and people who had never been to the West Side. The history of a city can create such dramatic rifts that can actually be challenged through some things that are maybe less complicated than, than you would expect. The power of just like kind of gathering people in the street works in many neighborhoods, even though it works kind of differently in each of those neighborhoods. I think all of the theater spaces are mismatched spaces looking for new futures. The Den is in a former department store and is now trying to be a theater. The Central Park Theater is an amazing theater that now doesn't have really a theater company or the, the kind of activity to inhabit it. Piccadilly Theater is like a, an, uh, amputated, an amputated theater. theater. Requires really creative thinking about how to bring new futures. All the projects, what they have in common for me is that we believe in the possibility of spaces to evolve and serve different needs. One thing that we've heard from people who have reached out to us, they liked that our approach wasn't grounded in a, a certain aesthetic that sometimes like comes with conversations around scarcity. When we go to spaces that produce this sense of possibility that something amazing and weird could happen that, that you didn't previously anticipate, you can kind of just like know it and feel it. <laughs> but we, we don't actually know yet like the recipe for recreating it, but it still feels like that, that's an intention we have and one that we think matches the interests of the people who we want to work with.